So the Winnipeg Jets lost their opening game of preseason to the Minnesota Wild 5-2. Season over, let's not rush to conclusions just yet and chat about that on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey friends, and welcome to tonight's episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. Thanks for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on all of your favorite podcasting platforms and YouTube. Doing so, of course, is always free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. Most of all, though, we just love and appreciate your support, especially as we are finally getting into the very near start of the season. It is preseason, folks. Uh, The Winnipeg Jets are finally back in town. Obviously, we had some Penticton stuff, and we've had camp this past week. But, like, let's be real, right? The preseason is the first uh, sign that things are really starting to get closer and closer to the start of the regular season. And, well, I'll be honest, uh, preseason uh, first game on Saturday was a little bit bumpy. Uh, the Jets obviously lost 5-2 to two to the Wild, which, you know, I'm sure there's at least some level of overreaction. Winnipeg fans are used to disappointment on a pretty routine basis. Let's not get too hasty and upset about it. It's just preseason. The main thing that I would say you want to watch in these games is the process, right? How did the team, uh, especially some of the individual skaters and some of the tactical approaches, bear out? We'll chat about that in just a moment, but before we go any further, just wanted to let you know about FanDuel. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel because you can place your uh, first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com to get started right now. Like I was saying, obviously, uh, the first preseason game was kind of a, a a tough watch in some respects, although I think if you look at the scoreline and what actually happened, uh, especially with how the Jets played overall, you might think the, the scoreline was a little uncharitable. For some context, uh, I would say that overall, Minnesota was definitely not as fast, and I think that they generally had to Focus on being overly physical, which I think for, you know, the Jets icing a very young roster and and lineup was probably not the best match. I think the Jets generally outshot and outcreated Minnesota. If you look at the shot clock, the Jets had like something like 40 shots on goal compared to Minnesota's 28-ish or so, uh, which I think was a pretty fair reflection. What I will say is that if I had one central issue with how the Jets played. Maybe it's just that I would have liked a bit more offense from the slot. I think the Jets maybe didn't create enough from some of the some of those spaces. And against a, a top player like Ballstedt, um, he is arguably the number one goalie prospect in all of hockey. I would say that he is, uh, in many respects, the next great one uh, to play in this division and really in the league. You know, you think about Hellebach, Shesterkin, and a few others uh, really ascending to the top ranks. Wallstedt's going to be up there very, very soon. Um, so all that to say, I wasn't really expecting the Jets to get a ton past him. Even though Minnesota was icing lots of fringe NHLers, um, lots of depth players and some prospects, uh, let's be real, Wallstedt is kind of good enough to, to stop uh, most of it. But all that said, you know, it was a uh, it was a tough game. I'd say that, you know, players uh, from the young ranks, especially guys like Lambert and Chibrikov and some of those others, they did pretty well. The veterans, I thought, looked okay. Uh, Generally speaking, you know, if I'm talking about standouts, uh, Colin Miller had an interesting game. Uh, He did score a goal. He also, unfortunately, had a a puck deflect off of one of his slap shot attempts on – uh, from a blue line point, and that ended up turning into a counter goal. Uh, Jakob Lauko had a breakaway and scored on Kakinen, which wasn't ideal. And I think Miller maybe had a couple of uh, risky passes that ended up getting picked off. And he's not exactly the fleetest skater to backtrack and stuff. So, uh, you know, it is what it is. Overall, though, I would say he looked pretty nice, especially as a power play quarterback. With him, 
you just kind of have to 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 sort of give and take with his game where you know he's a big volume shooter and sometimes that does get him into a little bit of trouble but i tell you what when he does actually hit pay dirt it is a pretty thundering uh slapper from the point so overall you know he looked exactly like you'd want him to for the third pairing i think he should have a fairly successful season and uh, i'm looking forward to it in terms of who might step in for hanala i didn't really see anyone in this game that i thought immediately earned that spot Hayden or Hayden Flurry, I think is probably the most likely candidate uh, in terms of players from this game who might sub in that spot. And I'll be honest, Flurry was not particularly great. Uh, he did, you know, just have a new uh, child born this morning. So, you know, congrats to the Flurry family. That's awesome. I'm sure he's probably not getting a lot of rest, uh, you know, especially having been with his family this morning. So, I'm not going to like sit here and like rip him apart. I just think in general, he looked a touch, you know, more on the moose side than anything. I think, you know, his reads and timing were a little bit off. There was definitely some rust. And I think in terms of whether or not he can play at the NHL level at this point, I don't know. Uh, I thought that he looked maybe okay as like a seventh defender, but in terms of anchoring that spot alongside Miller, I might not go that direction yet. Um, not saying that I'd prefer Stanley necessarily, but in general, I just I, I didn't see much that really stood out as a guy that I would immediately hand the reins to, which I'm a little disappointed in. In I was kind of hoping that he might be um, a bit more well-rounded, but so far, you know, first game with the Jets, yeah, you know, not going to read too too much into it, but he kind of looked like some of what I've seen about him, um, written by others uh, who have watched him in other squads, which is that. You know, he's he's at this point probably a depth defender, maybe more of a top for an uh, AHLer than anything. So we'll have to see if he can kind of turn it around under Chenoweth again. They do have some familiarity. Maybe that's the secret. Otherwise, um, in terms of the veterans, I guess you could say that most guys play their roles about as well as you could expect. Nemesnikov looked good. Uh, Appleton was fine. Ayafala was asked to play alongside Lambert and Velarde, and I, I don't know that that mixture was the best arrangement. Ayafala often gets tasked with be, being in the top six, and uh, I don't think he's really been able to keep up in terms of you know the offensive creation. He had a couple of good tips, and I think he was forechecking and really trying to work around the net, but I think his game is really suited to like the bottom six and uh, the PK especially. That's where he's like absolute money. If you only asked him to play like fourth line minutes and do PK stuff, he would be brilliant for you. But sometimes he's asked to be like a really good scoring uh, complimentary forward, and that's just not really his game. So um, he, he did try his best to keep up with Lambert, but Brad's really fast and constantly wants to create. And I think it was harder for that line to gel together. Um, but I, you know, with Arniel, I do get it. He was trying to, you know, pair at least one veteran with each of the kids, uh, one who's maybe a little more defensively savvy. But, you know, honestly, Lambert didn't really seem like he needed it. If anything, Brad was looking for more creative outlets to, to try and get some stuff going. But we'll chat about the kids specifically in just a little bit. I guess if you take away anything from this game, generally just rusty, but still uh, relatively fast. I think the Jets definitely tried to create a lot. The special teams, that's going to be a bit of a conversation for later because it wasn't exactly um, the, the most inspiring first game, but as guys are, are mostly just getting up to speed after several months off and, you know, this being a very youth heavy lineup without most of the guys who would even be starting on the special teams units, don't get too uh, in the weeds with this, but We'll chat about that in just a little bit. Before we talk about some of the prospects, though, and how they did, I did want to shout out our friends and partners at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. All you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. You can now win up to 100 times your money on Prize Picks with as little as four correct picks. And it's avail available in most states, including California, Texas, and Georgia, which is great for you. For those of you who are uh, in the U.S. and listening to this podcast, if you're in Winnipeg, maybe not as relevant relevant for you to know, but for those of you in the U.S., I know some of you, uh, someone is from Maryland here, um, Ravens fan right there. Uh, obviously, that's pretty fun, but 
you know, if you also want to join some of our top celebrities out there, like Drewski, Joe Budin, uh, and Suga Sean O'Malley, you can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the prize pick community each week. And of course, they always put their members first, so all withdrawals are fast, safe, and secure. When my picks hit, I can get my money in as little as 15 minutes. So if you're ready to get started, download the prize pick apps today and use promo code locked on NHL and get $50 off or get $50 instantly when you bet five dollars that's code locked on nhl and prize picks to get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars you don't even need to win to receive the fifty dollar bonus it's guaranteed prize picks run your game while we're at it i did also want to shout out our friends and partners at indeed when it comes to buying, uh, you know, a big championship team in, you know, top level sports, you have to search for better, right? You're looking to sign big players, make big trades, have huge acquisitions. A championship team requires so many different parts and it can be complicated to figure out how to make it all fit together. But running a business is actually pretty similar, especially when you're looking to hire top end employees. But the best way isn't to search at all. It's to match and you can match with Indeed. Indeed has uh, over 350 million global monthly visitors and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates from this pool fast. You can ditch the busy work because Indeed helps you schedule, screen, and message all in one platform so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers who use Indeed agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. Uh, I've, I've actually used Indeed myself when I was looking for work. I can personally attest to the fact that it is very comprehensive. Their resume system is great. It's super convenient, very fast, and it actually connected me with jobs that fit my salary and work experience requirements. So lots of great stuff there. There's over three and a half million businesses already using Indeed. I highly recommend that you jump in now, especially if you're a small business or a large business owner. Listeners of this show will even get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash locked on. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Hey, friends, and welcome back to tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day, thank you so much for rejoining us on tonight's episode as we are chatting about uh, game one of Winnipeg Jets preseason. And I know a lot of you are probably uh, maybe not super thrilled with the scoreline. I just don't really care about the scoreline, to be honest, when it comes to preseason, unless something like absolutely catastrophic happens and, you know, somebody gets hurt or we just clearly see that some player just doesn't look right. I just don't really focus on it that much. Um, the preseason's just dumb hockey, right? Yeah, the main thing is get through it, warm up and don't get injured. So in terms of, you know, what I take away, you know, I, I had some thoughts about uh, the overall game that you just heard. But then I wanted to drill down more into two things, right? The first thing that we're going to talk about is the kids. How do they do? That's the part that you all want to know about. That's probably the one thing that I think most folks are hoping for this season is uh, really good performances from the kids. And if this is anything to go by, it really follows up the Young Stars Classic in Penticton with guys like Lambert and Shiprikov really leading the way. Uh, I thought Lambert really looked impressive with a lot of the detail-oriented plays. You know, he didn't really score anything in this game, but I thought he had some smart passes. Uh, he really kept the offensive zone possessions alive with some great plays along the half wall. He was constantly being harassed, but somehow eluded pressure or made plays while being pinned. Uh, he just really tried to make things happen on a consistent basis, even if they weren't the flashiest and most explosive. But once he actually got up and running and was able to find space, he had a couple of good shooting at opportunities. I thought he made some really cool passes. Um, there's a lot to like in his game, and he just seems very versatile. But I think other people are going to be really impressed with his defensive game, too. Uh, I've heard from Will Scouch and others that you know, since moving uh, out of, of Finland, he's really worked on being a 200 foot player. He back checks aggressively. He tries to defensively mark. He tries to anticipate and jump uh, passing routes to force turnovers. And he had a couple of those in this game. I thought he was, you know, really uh, attuned to the details of the game, which is kind of what you're asking for when you want him to maybe become your eventual second line center. So uh, Lambert, I thought, you know, again, despite not having points, really impressive game and you know didn't really look out of place and if he had somebody else 
Um, uh, other than Velarde and Ayafalo on his wings, you know, maybe if you swapped Ayafalo for Chibrikov, you might have actually seen a point. Uh, Shibrikov actually did have a, a shift or two with Lambert in this game. I think it was like on a line change, and immediately they were able to catch out Minnesota's blue line with like a two-on-one. Uh, required a pretty difficult save from um, from Volstead, if I recall correctly. And so, I, I mean, you just know that when Lambert plays with skill, his game really just seems to blossom. And I, I, I do think that that's something that I'm excited for. Uh, I still kind of have some reservations about asking him to be the 2C off the bat, but um, if you run the second and third lines together roughly equal, I think that's a way to sort of softly introduce him in that role. You don't have to have him play like clear out and out 2C minutes, but if you can sort of balance that middle six deployment uh, and have Lowry at least take some of the harder matchups and let Lambert sort of grow into the role, I think that that could be a way that you go about this. Is it ideal? Probably not. I don't know if you want to have guys like learn on the fly, um, but I did see some interesting line combos from folks like Garrett Hole suggesting if Ehlers is actually on the first line with Connor and Shifley, which is technically a way to make that trio work, um, then you could have like Perfetti, Lambert, uh, and somebody else uh, potentially as as a line. Maybe you try, I don't know, um, the Mesnikov with them. There's like lots of ways to arrange this. One thing I'm kind of wondering is like Shubrakov for me, uh, again, another standout in this game. I thought he looked really good with Nemesnikov and they had some instant chemistry. You know, there were some good give and goes. I thought Shubrakov had some good shot selections and uh, was generally a pest. And it makes me wonder if he might fit alongside Lowry. That's been the, the general place I think most of us have sort of envisioned him. The problem is that the Jets just have a huge backlog of roster players and, you know, depth guys who have kind of cycled into those spots. So in terms of making that available, I, I just don't know if that's necessarily there. But otherwise, assuming that, you know, Brad uh, uh, and Chibrikov kind of make it, they could really make our top nine, you know, a lot more explosive than it was in previous years. But uh, otherwise, you know, you're you're probably wondering about guys like Jaeger and, and Julian. And I thought Jaeger had a fantastic game. I continue to believe that he really is close to pro ready. He needs to add a little more strength and stuff to his frame. But, you know, in terms of the the IQ, the reads, the defensive responsibility, uh, some of the, the plays that he forced and, and was able to create, he was great. He also had an assist on a Kobe Barlow goal at the end of the game. Bit of a garbage time goal, but, uh, you know, he won the faceoff, and Barlow just sort of whipped it right off the faceoff and somehow caught Volstead by surprise, which is pretty pretty hard to do, I, I will admit. But Jagger honestly probably deserved more than just a, a single assist. He was very impressive, and, you know, I, I didn't think that he'd be fighting for a roster spot next year, but he actually might. He was that good. So, uh, hopefully it continues throughout preseason, but I walked away feeling really good about his game. Julian's also going to be a pro at some level. Uh, I think he'll be a good Jet. He seems to have, again, very good defensive instincts. I think his two-way game is great. He's got soft hands. He seems to make good plays in, in, you know, in tight spaces. I was very impressed. Um, I've, I've liked him since Penticton. I think his growth with London has been phenomenal, and it just seems like he is carving himself out a real path to Winnipeg's middle or bottom six. Whatever he does at the NHL level, I will watch with uh, great enthusiasm, and I just hope that Walton also hits in the same way because Walton has a ton of exciting potential too. Other guys that might have stood out, uh, Dimitri Kuzman, I thought, had a really solid game. You know, maybe not crazy, but uh, I thought he made some good passes. I thought he had some uh, good late game, you know, breakouts and some good possessions. Elias Solomonson, I, I thought, had some flashes. But with him, it does kind of seem like he's maybe another year or two away, probably two years at least. I just think he needs time at the AHL level to get used to the timing and spacing uh, of the NHL and, and really of North American ice. The AHL is maybe not going to give him the full experience, but it will at least help him with um, some of the timing and, and spatial awareness on the different uh, ice specifications. So, you know, with him, I don't really worry. He did have some, you know, rough passes and plays. I think one of which either turned into a goal or something or, or very nearly did. But in general, I think with him, he's so smart and he's been playing such a mature game in Sweden that I really don't think it'll take him that long to adjust to North America. It's just he needs a bit of seasoning, and I think he'll get it here with the Moose. Um, otherwise, you know, most of the prospects, 
I, I probably didn't have a ton of thoughts. Uh, Connor Levis, he did get bullied around a little bit physically. That was kind of an issue with a lot of the guys tonight, just because Minnesota seemingly hit everything that moved. But when he was able to make plays, I thought he had, you know, those really soft hands around the goal line and around the net. He made some great passes. I think it maybe was to, to Aya follow or something for a great, uh, great play, some really tight, you know, short distance passes that are very hard to make between lots of skates and sticks. And Levis was still able to pull that off. That's why I'm really hoping that he actually translates to some level of pro player, maybe in the NHL. He has very, very good distribution in tight spaces. And that is a trait that not many Jets do have. So uh, rooting for Levis to really make it. I mean, I root for all of our prospects, but especially him. If there's a guy that I think people are going to talk about, it's probably going to be Tyrell Bauer. Bauer is fun, but to me, he's basically Stanley, just a little more limited. He tried his best and was trying to do, you know, shot blocks and cut down passing lanes, but sometimes he would go for a hit and take himself out of a, out of a rush blocking chance where it ended up becoming a two on one for his partner. And there were other times where he just, he struggled to get the puck up the ice and then he couldn't really facilitate breakouts. He did it a couple of times, but overall, I think in terms of his projection as an NHLer, I, I wouldn't bet on that. So um, wishing him the best. He's come a long way since his first days in Seattle. So I, I think in that respect, he's going to be great for the Moose. It's a little harder to project his NHL career, but you know, if he does get some, a uh, cup of coffees with the Jets, I wouldn't hate that. But I think if you're hoping for a little more from him, it, it would re probably require, um, some significant growth in his ability as a puck carrier, but he's a hardworking kid. He really fights for the badge. And, uh, even if he only ever does it for the Moose, who cares? Uh, that's great. You know, having a nice winning organization at both levels would be fantastic. And sometimes it's just nice to have guys who have really strong character and leadership. So uh, overall, you know, eh, sure, this game wasn't great, I guess you could say. Kakinen, I think, had probably a, an evening to forget in that. But, you know, it is what it is. I think if you're looking for positives, the youth definitely impressed. And that's probably the most important part. Ignore the scoreline for a little bit, focus on the process, and if that's the side of the game that you're looking at, there is reason to be uh, encouraged by some of the performances that we saw this evening. Now, obviously, uh, one part of the game that I think is probably worth speaking about a little more in detail is the special teams. That's one of the biggest things that's haunted the Jets, and I think the PK and power play showed some adjustments and some things that still need some work. So we'll chat about that in just a little bit. But before we go any further, I did want to shout out our friends and partners at FanDuel. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. You've heard us talk about uh, FanDuel before because they're safe and secure, they're super convenient, and they have tons and tons of lines, bets, and propositions. If you're thinking about the Jets season, uh, you may want to bet the over on our standings predictions just because I think we're projected to have 94 and a half uh, points by their uh, by their projections, which on the one hand does feel a little low. But, you know, there is always a chance that the Jets maybe take a step back. But I'm, I'm kind of betting on Hellebuck this year. So maybe you should, too, and go for the over. Whatever it is, you know, whether you're watching a game like the Jets or maybe an, an NFL game, if you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets, which helps you make an informed live in the moment bet when it hits. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's all on FanDuel.com. Hey friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Every day, thank you so much for rejoining us uh, really quickly on our closing thoughts tonight. We are just chatting about uh, what's been, you know, perhaps not the, the best outcome for the first Jets preseason game, but like I said, I really don't care about the, the overall scoreline unless something is particularly catastrophic and scares me that the future is grim, but I, I don't really have that sort of reaction about a first preseason game. Uh, what I will say is that, you know, the special teams were kind of a little bit of a mixed bag in this game. Uh, obviously, this is the first time that uh, Chenoweth and Payne are, are really seeing Winnipeg skaters uh, in a, a sort of pseudo real game environment. So, you know, don't don't read too much into it. The power play, I thought that they were really trying to create more puck, you know, off the puck movement and get guys rotating more. 
it did lead to some confusion. I think there were times where it seemed like guys weren't really sure if they were supposed to move or if they should stay in place. And I, I think you saw some old habits from last season, even with guys who weren't necessarily working on those power plays last year. A lot of them were in juniors and stuff. It's going to take some time to, to shift the philosophy, I think, of the power play unit. But, you know, if the if the veterans start to pick up on it sooner, I think that's the most important part, because those are the guys that are going to be starting this year. And hopefully, you know, those uh, increased, uh, I guess, rotations and and uh, improved passing and cycling will actually create and stretch, uh, you know, PK diamonds a little bit more. I think that it would be nice to see that happen. The Jets power play, unfortunately, I think went dry for the entire evening and they had several opportunities in this game. Not great to not score, and sometimes they didn't even really get more than a shot or two off, but it is what it is. I mean, it's preseason. I'm not going to stress too much. Lambert looked like he was very comfortable on the power play, and maybe that's the most important part for now. Uh, Miller also showing that he can QB that role too and sometimes score. <laughs> that was uh, something that he was certainly trying to do in this game. Got very close in a few opportunities, but unfortunately no dice on the power play. The PK, uh, I know it did concede a couple of goals. I will say that the second PK looked a lot better. I thought that the the aggression and the pressuring on the puck carriers was nice. I think some of the stuff that happened was probably just a product of the personnel. You know, maybe a point shot that maybe shouldn't have been fully screened and getting through, uh, deflected off of some guys. You know, Salamonson on another opportunity that ended up going through maybe could have tied up a stick. I forget if that was at even strength or on the power play, but... You know, just small little details like that that do make a huge difference. And sometimes you had double deflections getting through from distance. So um, the PK, a little hard to assess right now. I think, you know, as we get deeper into preseason, I'd like to see what Chenoweth is able to to pull together. But I, I did like some of the pressuring. I thought that the, the diamond didn't really sit as static. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest things. You don't want to have a PK diamond that doesn't pressure at all. And that was sort of traditionally how the Jets did. You do have to be careful with how much risk you take. The more you move that diamond, the more space it gives your opponents. But in some ways, that's kind of by design. You are going to have to take risks. And if you want to force guys to misplay a pass and make a mistake, then you have to close off that space and force them to make the uh, make the pass attempt first. If you just give them the time and space, they will pick it apart like they have done year after year against Winnipeg. So uh, I'm going to reserve judgment on the special teams. That's like one of my big focuses this year. If that area can improve by a considerable margin, I would already say the six season is halfway to being successful. So uh, let's build those good habits. Let's see the Jets continue. Obviously, tomorrow's game is going to be against Edmonton with a totally different lineup. I am looking forward to that. It's just nice to have preseason and and really just regular Jets hockey back. Obviously, this is not really the full thing. Uh, it's it's a bit of a teaser. And so begins, you know, for a lot of Jets fans, the longest two weeks of their lives. But we've been without hockey for months now. So at this point, it was just a couple more weeks until early October. But let me know how you're feeling about the young prospects. What stood out to you in these games? Were you surprised by anything? Did you hate anything? Let me know in the comments below or at my social medias at HLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. By the time that you're hearing this, of course, I referred to uh, the Oilers game is happening tomorrow, but it is. This is Monday. Uh, this episode is going out uh, on Monday. So obviously uh, on Tuesday's episode, we'll probably have a more detailed breakdown of the Oilers game. I just wanted to separate them out because this is two totally different lineups. And I think it you know, probably deserves viewing it in that respect. So uh, we'll have some takeaways then. But for tonight's episode, that is going to be all the time that we have. I thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. We'll see you back here tomorrow for, for even more preseason coverage. And, uh, you know, maybe somewhere in there is a Cole Perfetti extension if we are lucky. As always, have a great night and go Jets go.